Thank you for joining us. This is live with Miami's Community News, and, and you want the job back, and that's why you're running again. That is correct. All right. So let's talk about you were councilman for 10 years. Absolutely. That yeah. is a significant portion of the life of the city. Oh, right. You're absolutely that's right. That's gigantic. Yes. All right. And when what were the years that you served? Uh, I'm trying to think. I left in uh, 2020. Okay. Okay. So around 2010. When was uh, the city incorporated? Uh, well, when we go back, it's been around for 25 years. Yeah. So you just. So you, know, you, were, you were in the second group of people. I was in the second group. Second right. group. The that was second group. Right. Second yep. group of there. Yep. Leading Absolutely. the way. Right? right. And we see the city of Miami Gardens. Before as a city, people would shun it. They would go away. You know, that's where those, those people live. Over exactly. There. And exactly. that's where the crime is. And that's where that right. stuff is. Right. But it's really made. Everybody there, not just the politicians, not just the people that work in City Hall, but the residents have taken a higher level of interest and concern about my hometown, the city of Miami Gardens. Oh, absolutely. You know, when I came up, my daughter was a, my oldest daughter was a Silver Knight finalist in science. Congratulations, and, Bob. And, well, and everything I had to get her involved in, she had to leave her community. I mean, you know, when you're the third largest city in Dade County, the 15th largest city in the state. You shouldn't have to leave your city for anything. So tell folks how many people actually live in Miami Gardens. Uh, 110,000 people. Okay. That's a big so, number. So that's about twice the size of Coral Gables. Absolutely. Right. It's, right. it's eight times, I think, bigger than Pinecrest. Right. Almost twice the size of Doral. Yes. It's gigantic. It's big. And yep. It's, it's huge. So you, you got used to sending her away to go, and she couldn't do it in town. Couldn't do it in town. So... Let's talk about things that are of importance to the people in, in Miami Gardens. I'd like to discuss economic development that's going to be taking place and what you'd like to see take place in Miami Gardens. Tell us. Okay. Well, you know, I, I really want to see growth, but I want control growth. I mean, when you look at Miami Gardens in terms of Ad Valorium, Texas, about 45 about 45% five of our income comes from Ad Valorium, Texas. So you have to go other places to get it. So there's a, a great need for just common things that you see in communities, like restaurants. I mean, major restaurants, major hotels, theaters, bowling alleys, you know, those types of things that make communities community. And right now, I, a couple of times a year, you have some big, big events up there. What was the last big event that there was in Miami Gardens? The last big event was Formula One. Racing. Right, Formula One. Well, well in before Miami no, Gardens. in Miami Gardens. Before that, no, just recently there was uh, soccer. That's, so the town that nobody wanted to incorporate back then, the town that people that were afraid to go in, now has one of the most popular races, car races in the world. Absolutely, right here in Miami Gardens. Gardens. <laughs> We like it when it says yep. Miami, but yep. you guys like it more when it says Miami Gardens. Gardens. Absolutely, because it defines who we are. Yep. You know, you have the Dolphins, okay? You have major musical events at Hard Rock Stadium. You have soccer coming. Do you have jazz in the park? We have jazz in the gardens. That, that, jazz in the gardens. That's a national event. Absolutely. People yeah. from around the world come to that event. And, um Susie McDowell, a friend of ours, I know she was actively involved with that for many, many, many years. Right, and she still is involved in that. Yes. We love you, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, I have a special relationship with her, and she's certainly opened my eyes to so so many mm -hmm. things. So let, let's talk uh, at this point about infrastructure improvements. It could in include police, uh, parks, and uh, <clears throat> education, and health care. Well, you know, there were a lot of things going wrong with Miami Gardens when we received it from the county. There are a lot of things that was just dormant. So one of the things, you know, we decided to do is we, we decided that we needed sidewalks on all the streets. I mean, this day and time, you would think that that would be a given, uh -huh. but it wasn't, okay? So those things are happening for the infrastructure. Uh, lighting, uh, you know, the street lights, uh, you know, we pay in a, a special lighting district and we don't get the benefit of lights that you see in cities. I think our lights were like 300 yards apart, which the current standard, I think, is somewhere around 150. So we, we got that going for us. We also wanted to make sure that our roads were good. 
So now we were able to get, you know, money from transportation, pave all the roads, most of the roads. There were no, there are no dirt roads in Miami. Let me do a shout out for yeah. you. CITT, give them some more money right, up exactly. there, please. Come on, exactly. Mr. Betancourt. Right. right. So we, we've gotten that, the basics, but we want to go beyond that. We want to go with beautification of our, our right-of-ways and those types of things. When citizens see that and... And visitors, when they're going through, they see that that's like the crown molding that's in your house. You go, they're paying special attention to it. All the things in other cities that are normal. We didn't have. Right. And so we look at it and we go, why aren't we getting it? Because sometimes it takes the power of a group of people to be able to influence the other folks that are going to fund those, those things. Sidewalks seem pretty normal. Lighting seems pretty right. normal. You would right? think in communities those things were already there. And it wasn't. And of course, you know, it was a, a suburban community where people moved away from the inner city, out in the suburbs. So a lot of the amenities that you that you would normally have was not there. So when we became a city in, in, in the tenure that I was there, you know, we looked at all of those things that were basic to cities and said, we need to start implementing those things in our city. Now, Councilman, we know that affordable housing is that, that is the go-to phrase right now. And it's sort of a misnomer. There is no affordable housing, <clears throat> but government still has to do something to make it at least so the people in the area can live there. What can the city do to make it a little bit more comfortable for people? Well, you know, I think we're looking at creative ways. You know, of course, uh, we, 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 we don't have a lot of room. We have more room than most cities. But instead of going, you know, horizontal, a lot of cities are going vertical. Yeah. We're going to look at probably going vertical with some things. But but one of the concepts that, that I've come up with, and uh, I'm sure a whole lot of people have may have heard about this before, uh, a lot of the churches have a lot of land. Yes, they do. A lot of the churches have big mortgages. Because of COVID, COVID and the attendance in these churches, the attendance in, in the, the dues and the memberships and all of those things that whatever denomination you are, are not occurring. So one of the things that has worked for my church, and we were in dire straits to come up with money because we lost a lot, a lot of the older clientele had passed on, or people had moved away. So we, we're getting with a developer, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna partner with develop, the developer, and we're gonna utilize some of the property that we have, and churches have a lot of ground for parking, and do some vertical parking for that area. But we're also going to do and looking at doing some affordable housing. 200 units here, 50 units there. That's a way that we can start to pull pieces of, of the problems that we're having with finding places for people to live and doing those things. Now, that seems to be like a quick fix because the land is already there. It's, it's, it's not really being used. Churches aren't getting the membership. They have these high payments that they have to pay every month because most of the churches, they don't own, okay? This is a way that a developer can buy the property, buy the church, turn it back over to the church, and go into a partnership with the church and the housing unit right on the property. It's quite innovative. And we, we the churches, you know, the God bless them. They knew in advance we need a single-story church with a lot of parking. Right. And so we see that that's shifting through the years, and I'm sure that's mm -hmm. the same across the country, but in particular here, we, we see it yeah. right down the street from here. One of the churches on a huge piece of property, and what they did is they, they sold part of it. Right. And they're putting up the, uh, townhouses that are right. going there, 25 or 30, but the church benefits. Everybody got, benefits. Have 50 to 75 people are going to yeah. move in there, and it fits into the neighborhood. Yeah. So one of the things that we're all concerned with is our public, our safety, our public safety. We want to feel safe when we're in our homes and when we walk down the street and we go to the stores. What is, has, has the city and the police department done and what can they do to make that a little better? Yeah. Well, I think that there's some crimes that's going to happen no matter what you do. You can have a police on every corner and you still, someone wants yes. to shoot you or domestic stuff, it's going to happen. But one of the things that the city of Miami Gardens has, and I like to beef it up, is a real-time crime center. Okay, we have Shot Spotter. Okay, what is and it called? Shot Spotter. Okay, so it's a, it's a system where they can pinpoint where a gun is fired, 
within so many feet, within seconds. So there was a big throughout move. Throughout the city? Throughout the city. Oh, my goodness. Yep. How good is that? Yep. So there was a big move to get those in locations in the city. I'm hoping that it's been working on it and implementing it. It's like giant microphones with GPSs on them. Exactly. But, but what I'd like to see more so than that is in our intersections. I mean, you can watch the news in the morning and they can pinpoint, pinpoint any area. You know, they can tell you what's going on on I-95, the Pelmet Expressway. I like to see a system like that implemented in Miami Gardens. Now, if that's not a deterrent, I don't know what is a deterrent. Well, and we, we know that, that, that crime is typically younger people, right? right? They're not 70-year-olds mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. that stuff, whatever younger people mm -hmm. is. But it really starts when they're this big and, and, in the, and inside their mom. Yep. But at some point, the, some of the kids go off. And, mm -hmm. and it's the youth programs that keeps, keeps them connected. Right. And in particular... A lot of in sports. Yeah. So what what is the city doing so, so, for youth programs? Okay. So so let me tell you my thoughts on that. Okay. And uh, by the way, I'm a scientist. I spent my whole career in the pharmaceutical industry. I worked for the number one, number two pharmaceutical company in the world. So so I have a you know a wide a range of of experiences with with medicine and healthcare and those types of things. Spent a lot of time in schools, undergrad at Florida and M, grad at Tuskegee, grad at Duke, grad at Barry, grad at University of Miami Medical School, uh, was a business team development leader for the whole Southeast United States. So I traveled the world. So what I do is unique. Everybody can't do what I do. Everybody can do a book bag giveaway. And I think those are very important. Okay, but I don't invest my money in that when I was a council person because there's no need in seven people all doing the same thing. What I invested my money in building science labs, building butterfly gardens, buying microscopes for schools. Out of the 23 schools in Miami Gardens, out of the 23, that includes elementary, middle school, and high school, 17 of those schools have either a science project or a butterfly garden that I built at my expense. Very nice. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars doing those things. You know, I truly believe that schools and municipalities need to work hand in hand. I and mean, when you look at communities that are really going to get doing things, you, just, you see those things going. And, and, and I tell you that story to tell you that I developed in Miami Gardens, an elementary science fair, the only one of its kind by a municipality in all of the United States. And what happens is, the second week in December, when I think the greatest need for money occurs, I have my science fair. I ask every school, elementary school, to do their own science fair and pick the top seven people or the top 10 people, winners from their, their science fair. And when I was there, I would pick them up by bus and limousine. I would transport them first class to St. Thomas University. Oh, very nice. And they spent the whole day at St. Thomas presenting their science fair projects to real scientists and real science graduate students. What, what an experience for them. Not only for them, for parents. A lot of these kids have never been on a campus, a college campus. And never, some of them have never inspired to be something. So and, this is a whole new avenue that I uncovered there. And sometimes if, you, if you're really lucky, just say, this is what a college can look like. And you could belong there and be there if you wanted to do oh, that. Absolutely, absolutely. So when did you develop that in your brain of giving? When did that start for you? Probably as a child, uh, my grandmother. We, we had to give back in community. Every Saturday morning when I got up, I had to do something in the community that someone that needed. And you couldn't accept any money now. You did it gratis. Okay. How old were you, more or less? How old am I? No, 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 oh. at the time. Oh, at the time, probably around eight or nine years old. 
and, and I and I and I I will never forget it because there was a there was a young lady from the church. Her name was Mother Green. She was blind, and my job was to make sure all her garbage for that week was taken out for pickup, and her yard was cut. That was my job every week to make sure that happened. And my brothers and sisters, and they all had chores. That was a long time and ago. You, and you're right there, right now. Right there. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Right. And to be fulfilled like that and to be able to, mm-hmm. when other people see you doing that, I'm, I'm sure you hope that others get inspired. Oh, absolutely. Do yeah. I don't ask anybody to do anything that I don't do myself. A lot of people, when I was a councilman, couldn't believe I was out there digging holes with my hands, planting things. I was a PTA president for Let 10 me years. See those hands. Okay. I was a PTA president for 10 years in the elementary school long before my kids had left. But I, I do believe that you have to give in community. You know, I've been lucky and fortunate. And I think that when you have opportunities and you exceed, succeed, I think you need to reach down and try to pull people up. I wake up every morning with some goal of helping somebody. And so often we don't know who it is, and I'm not sure that it matters, but that it occurs. Recently, I was at a stoplight and I was approached by a homeless person and he's he's coming towards me. I'm thinking all sorts of things. So I wrote a column about him. Here he comes. Am I going to give him any money? Do I want to touch him? Am I going to ignore him? Am am I going to look the other way and pretend that I don't see him standing Mm -hmm. there? Are you going to reach in your pocket and just whatever bill it is, just reach? Mm-hmm. What if it's a hundred dollar bill? Now I want to give him coins. You are you gonna are you gonna touch his hand? And I'm having all these thoughts, and I write it down. It was perfect, and this is the way it ended. Oh, the light turned green. I'm on to my next lesson. And so often, when we can experience things like that, and we could come at ease with what we think and how we uh, make changes, and it can help other people. My brother and I got to the point: if you're going to give, make a difference. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, don't give a dollar. Yeah. yeah. Make, really make, make, make it. Make a difference. Yeah. yeah. And because we understand that. Uh, what, and when, you're, when, you, when you need that, when somebody reaches out for you, what a difference. Hurricane Andrew comes, destroys our house. People started sending us gifts, toiletries, money. And I said to my wife, what did we ever do to deserve that? I remember saying it flat out like that. I'm bawling like crazy. And... And I said, well, because people want to give, and two, that they recognize who you are and that you need this help right now. And so Grant and I were hesitant always to let other people pay for things. Then I realized we're denying them the opportunity to feel good about themselves. Right, exactly. Let them pay for it. Yeah. Right? And so it took a long time to, mm-hmm. for us to do that. And I think there's a lot of lessons that you're teaching people, even if just by doing it and they're watching. Mm-hmm. Here's a man... <clears throat> But that's been giving now for, you know, 95% of your life. Oh, absolutely. So you've been making a gigantic difference. When you first ran in 2009 and 2010, mm-hmm. what caused you to go into politics? Oh, well, I was appointed. And, and that's an interesting question that you asked. For years, people had said, you need to run for office. You need to run for office. You're doing everything in communities. You're doing things in schools that politicians do. You're using all your own money. But I felt that, you know, I was fortunate and I was able to give back. And I wanted to set an example for other people in the community that were fortunate to give back. So I never ran for office the first time. I was actually appointed. And that's what got me there. Most of my friends, and my background is science, most of my friends to this day can't believe I was I, I ran for office and I was a politician for ten years. Yep. So that seat is for a four year seat. It's a four year seat. seat. Absolutely. So what happened at the end of the first first term? The, uh, so I filled in for someone that was vacation. So I was appointed for two years. Okay. And subsequently, I ran two other times and was reelected for that seat. And I eventually termed out after a while. That's wonderful. Yeah. All right. So you're certainly a giving soul. Tell me. Tell us about your children. Well, have three children, two two girls and, and, and a, a boy. Uh, uh, not as successful as I would like them to be, but they're headed in that direction from a different generation. But they're all givers. They they all understand 
the process of giving. Uh, my daughter uh, was a giver. She would bring kids home from school. They need this. They need that. Uh, one of the things that I made it mandate that, that my kids do, every year they put together a Christmas list, okay, of things that they wanted. Once they gave me that list, I chose something off that list to give to someone in the community. And every year we've done that throughout their whole educational career. So speaking of children, there's a young lady that I met. She was in 10th grade. When she was in second grade, she said to her mom that, mommy, daddy, you know, there's some kids that can't read. And I'm watching the mom, I'm, she's nodding her head. I said, so what did you do? Her name is Lauren Page. And she says, well, I started getting books. Eight years later, she redistributed over 330,000 books. Yeah. I said, how's that garage of yours doing? <laughs> how's your dad's pickup truck? And she's setting the example like you were at such a young age. And so now I've seen her that she was on, the, on some of the shows by other hosts. And I couldn't brag enough about this young lady. <laughs> that mm. there she is now teaching recipients. There's oh. good people out there to be able to yeah. give that. So, yeah. you know, one of the other things that, that has certainly come to light recently since COVID is uh, the, the need for quality health care mm -hmm. and how lacking most people are um, getting access to it and, and it's sometimes afraid. And, and when CHI during 1920, 21, when they took the buses and they took the COVID down to Princeton and Goulds and Homestead and took the healthcare to the people so they didn't have to worry about transportation, they could be there near their homes and their loved mm -hmm. ones. It really inspired me. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to go where they are, mm -hmm. not tell them they got to come where we are. Yeah. What can Miami Gardens do to improve the physical health and the mental health of well, its well, residents? And, and I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I, I sit as a board member on the Jesse Trice Community Health Systems, and I've also sat as the chairman of the board for the foundation. Uh, I was appointed by two governors, a Democrat and a Republican, one to sit on the state board uh, for uh, post-secondary education, and another one I sat as the representative for the Department of Children and Families, and the Education Commissioner, I also sat on the Children's Trust Board. But since my background was science, and you know, not until recently has science become popular. So I was, you know, I was always sort of like the nerd, everybody talking sports, although I was a good athlete, you know. So what I decided to do is to utilize my ability, being in the pharmaceutical industry, working around medicines and stuff, and to see how certain things save lives in the polymers and the, the, the plants that we use to make medicines, I decided to build a botanical garden in Miami Gardens. And by the way, that botanical garden, again, is the only botanical garden by a municipality in the whole country. We haven't done a good job in Miami Gardens of talking about two jewels there, the science fair, and at one point I want to close, with, I mean, make about the science fair. In the science fair, when I was there, we didn't give away certificates and trophies. Kids walked away with cash money. A kid can walk away two weeks before Christmas, and you want to talk about economic development, with $1,500, $2,000 in cash money. And if you were the parent of one of those kids that won, and we had a lot of parents, we may have had 20 winners. You got $100 to jumpstart your science fair project. And when I started that program, I went to Florida Memorial, St. Thomas, University of Miami, FIU. No one really wanted to be involved in the school system with the science fair, except for St. Thomas. And the reason St. Thomas did it because the dean of science and I had a commonality. We both had a pharmaceutical background, mm -hmm. okay? St. Thomas jump-started. Now that science fair, every university I just talked to you about is dying to be a part of the science fair. And the science fair is not about making kids become scientists, and that's what people don't understand. The science fair is teaching kids the scientific skills or skills to make good determination, to make, to do, make, 
rational decisions uh, and to deter negative behavior. You know, looking at what the consequence of this is and the consequence of that is. Now, in the long run, if they become scientists and a lot of them want to, fine. Yes. But, but and we, and we open up the door for careers that people of color have traditionally not been involved in. You know, we've been doctors and lawyers, but we've never been etymologists, you know, or microbiologists, you know, etheologists, you know, the study of fish, those types of things. So it gives them a new sense of, hey, of worth. I never knew this was that. You know, how do you know what you don't know? You don't. So that's what makes me different as a council person in sitting up there. Uh, Councilman, we have a couple of minutes left. Okay. But I would like, uh, can we put his website up on the address? If people want to find out more information, they go to your website. Absolutely. And but sh should you get elected, what, what, what does the future look like for Miami Gardens, the future vision of what you'd like to see? I like to see a healthy community. I, I think people don't understand if you're not healthy, you can't function. And when I talked about that garden, all the growers down south said to me that it would never work. The garden was placed on a, a, a piece of land that was in Rico family farm. It was a dairy farm. Because I was a scientist, I formulated my own soil. So I've imported plants from around the world in that garden that represents every culture. And in those plants, you have medical breakthroughs. I have fig trees that have potassium and magnesium. We know always know what, what those things are for. You know, I have star fruit, all these unusual fruits, jackfruit, uh, pomegranate. So in that garden, our community people can come. If you're a diabetic and you needed potassium, most of the time we, we, they, we've been told, well, drink orange juice. Well, suppose you have acid reflux. That's going to mess up your stomach. Go get a, eat a fig. You can go to the, the garden and eat a natural fig. So what we've done, I, and it's built on the senior center, you would be amazed at how many people gravitate to that natural fruit from that botanical garden. And, and I think we've started to build a healthy community. Uh, you know, I leave it to the ministers to talk about the spiritual prolonging of life, but I want to talk about the, the, the healthy part of prolonging life by eating right. Uh, we've, we've had all these gardens that we've, we've sent out to, uh, people in the community, uh, the backyard gardens, but, but the backyard gardens with things that are life-saving, that prolongs life. Councilman, it's been a pleasure talking with you. You've inspired me. And sometimes we wonder when we do these, how we each chose this to happen. I know it was not an accident. It was more than coincidental. And so great lessons for us and for the world. And we wish you lots of good luck with your with your upcoming election and for continuing to serve the people. Yep. And thank you for having me. Pleasure. Thank you very much for being mm -hmm. here. Folks, again, uh, if you want to find out more about the councilman, go ahead and you can see there is website address up on the uh, on the screen there. Or, and there's a phone number that you can reach. And remember, take care of yourselves and your family. Have a great day, folks. Yeah.